Good morning, everyone. What a beautiful, beautiful day we're having today, and it has been that way the last few days here in the lovely state of the Mitten. And uh, welcome to New Era Bible Church Virtual Live this morning. Uh, we are glad that you have been able to rustle yourself and uh, settle down. And uh, don't get too comfortable, because next week we will be right back here, uh, unless uh, the Lord returns. So uh, plan on that. Uh, we want you to uh, make sure that you review the safety guidelines that we have uh, uh, mailed to you and emailed to you previously uh, that we were going to do a couple of weeks ago, uh, but uh, uh, those things will certainly be in place. So please bring your mask and uh, come, and we will look forward to being together. Uh, we want to again remind you all that our annual business meeting is coming up the first Sunday of June, uh, right after uh, the morning service at the top of the hour at 11 o'clock. So please plan on that. We will not have Sunday school uh, that day, uh, but uh, everything else will be as normal. And then, of course, uh, we're looking forward to our senior recognition Sunday on June 14. Uh, we have five seniors that are graduating this year or have graduated by now. And uh, we want to recognize them and honor them and celebrate with them. Of course, uh, this is Memorial Day and uh, Memorial Day weekend. And so uh, we want to make sure that we recognize those who have given the ultimate sacrifice so that we may enjoy the freedoms that are still ours. Take a moment and enjoy this tribute and be inspired. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, it is a privilege for us to be able to bow before you again this morning and to thank you 
for the message of sacrifice that we recognize and honor today and this weekend. For so many throughout the history of our great nation who have willingly sacrificed the ultimate of their own lives for the sake of our freedoms, we are eternally grateful. For families that have endured significant loss, we pray for your tremendous grace to be their sustenance. And Father, help us as a nation never to lose sight of what we owe so deeply to those who have given the last full measure of devotion. Lord, uh, there is no way that our words here are able to add anything to what they have given, but we're so grateful. And it reminds us of the sacrifice that you provided, sending your Son to die in our place, to be our substitute, our sacrifice. Father, as we pray today, we remember our country. We remember our president, our vice president, remember our governor, remember all of our uh, local officials. And Father, we pray for your wisdom to prevail in the hearts and minds of these who are our leaders. You remind us in your word that the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, and as the rivers of water, he moves it wheresoever he desires. So Father, move and work through those who lead. Surround them with good, godly influences, people of integrity. As we gather today and we continue to find ourselves stalled by this pandemic, we pray for grace for the moment. We pray that you will help us not to give in to feelings of despair and despondency. Father, as we think of those who have suffered tremendously, we think even this week within our own state of folks uh, east of us who have been extricated and evacuated because of these horrible floods, dams bursting, 10,000 people out of homes, lives uprooted instantly. And so, Father, we would ask for your provision, pray that you would allow the body of Christ there locally to be able to be the hands and And as we gather here, we continue to pray one for another. Lord, we would continue to pray for Joanne Osborne today. Ask especially for your grace and timing to be perfect in her life. Sustain her. And uh, Lord, when you are ready, we pray that you will just lovingly and quietly take her to be. Pray your sustaining grace upon her family as they care for her and love her in the time that remains. Father, we would pray for those who continue to battle the ravages of cancer, asking for strength for help, asking, Father, for the opportunity for your spirit to lift up. And, Father, for those needs that are all around us, allow us to be Jesus with skin on. Today, as we look at your word, may we be encouraged and challenged afresh follow you complete. We'll thank you in Jesus. Amen. Now let's worship together. There are a number of new songs I want us to look at and listen to today, and we'll work on some of these next week uh, during our live time together. But uh, it's always good to find new modern hymns that are being written, and these are filled with great, great theology, and they sound really good. Hope you enjoy. You, my God, have saved my soul. I am yours forevermore. I won't be moved of this, I'm sure. You, my God, and you saved my soul. Came for me held in chains. 
chains by the enemy But you broke them in victory Now I'm free, I am free You're my joy and you are my hope I am saved by your grace alone I will sing of your love for me I am free
you'll see when all my tears are wiped away.
find healing in His sacrifice. I will wait for you. I will wait for you through the storm. Memorial Day reminds us of, uh, of sacrifice, reminds us of loss. Uh, I think this is going to be a, a difficult day for a lot of people, uh, provided uh, many cemeteries are closed because of the pandemic. I know certainly Arlington is closed and Washington, and that's going to be very, very difficult. When it comes to grief, uh, it is normal, certainly, for people to grieve after they have suffered a significant loss. Grief is but a painful process of uh, adjusting to a new normal. Uh, it is uh, adjusting to a new set of circumstances. Uh, eventually, there is acceptance that comes around and it takes place uh, and grief subsides and then a person can again find some joy in living and moving forward. However, there are times, aren't there, when grief can lead to a hopelessness rather than acceptance. And that is when despondency sets in. A perpetual, downward, spiraling hopelessness which seems unending. In Psalm 13, David faces despondency. Uh, he feels forgotten. Uh, it's as if nobody seems to care. It's those types of feelings that cause you and I to be able to be drawn so often to the Psalms, when we find ourselves facing days that are blue and feelings that are miserable. And an examination of the book of Psalms reveals that many of the background of the Psalms remain a mystery. We don't know what inspired David or others to write each and every Psalm. However, we are able to find that we can resonate those words, uh, often written to exemplify the the painful feelings that you and I feel 
when life is filled with despair and despondency. What seems to be the issue at hand here in Psalm 13? What are the circumstances that have triggered such tremendous grief? David struggles with despondency in this song, and it became so intense, it prompted him to write these words out of the depths of his breaking heart. Now, we're not exactly sure what the circumstances were that caused Israel's greatest king to feel this way and to write this way, but we do know that some of David's darkest days came before he was officially promoted to the throne of Israel. God, you see, was in the process of preparing David for an immense task. And therefore, God used the trials to shape David into a man of maturity and inner strength. Now, if we examine the backstory of David's life, we're looking at probably 1 Samuel uh, chapter 18 and chapter 20. We see that David, in the, that context, has just slain Goliath, the giant of Gath, the champion of the Philistines. Now, that labeled the Philistines a defeated foe in the eyes of Israel, and it certainly elevated David to become the equivalent of a teenage rock star, <laughs> the most famous young hero in the land. And the result was uh, people singing his praises. Saul has slain his thousands, remember, and David his tens of thousands. Well, uh, that led to some insane jealousy of King Saul. Oh, how he hated the fact that David, even for a short time, was more popular than he. And the result was such a fit of hostility that Saul became focused on murdering David. No wonder Israel's psalmist king enters the deep recesses of despondency. From that time on, David became the object of Saul's diabolical plan. And even though he was innocent before God, even though he was loyal to the king, David literally ran for his life. And he lived as a fugitive in the hills of Judea for more than, get this, a dozen years. He was hunted and haunted by a madman king. No wonder he entertained doubts at times, and he often had only the Lord to turn to in those great moments of overwhelming despondency. Here is Israel's anointed king-elect who is existing like a beast in the wilderness, running for his life. He must have wondered if the chase would ever end. Now, with that as a backdrop, Psalm 13 certainly makes a little more sense to us. This is a song that is addressed to God, and it consists of six verses that build. Uh, David begins in a pit of despondency, and he concludes on a mountaintop of ecstasy. So this morning I want us to look at three parts of David's song of despair, three stanzas, if you will. The first stanza has to do with David on his face, beginning in verse 1. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? These first two verses remind us of despondency where somebody spends most of their time flat on the ground, crushed under the weight of sorrow. And in these verses, we see David swamped by the overwhelming trials of life, resorting to, to four common responses that you and I have, that we all have when it comes to handling despondency. Four mental escape routes that we often take when we face similar pressure. The first one is the route that basically says, well, God has forgotten me forever. Question, when is the last time you felt abandoned by God? David writes about that very emphatically. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? Since the testing has continued so long without any hope of relief, David finally finds himself emotionally crushed beneath the load, and he wonders, God, have you abandoned me? The second 
route that is taken is often the mindset that says, God just doesn't care about me. David is right there. He is wallowing in gross self-pity. How long are you going to hide your face from me? These feelings of abandonment whispered lies to David. Things like, listen, David, God has simply lost interest. He said He would take care of you. He said He would bear your burdens. He would lift your load. Look around, David. None of that has happened. Does that sound familiar at all to the way you and I look at things sometimes? Nevertheless, isn't it refreshing that we can always see God's Word being painfully honest by how often we see ourselves reflected in the pages of Scripture? We say to ourselves, well, yeah, that was David, but that's often me. Thirdly, the mentality that says, I'm going to have to work this out myself. Ah, there's the good old American dream, isn't it? Pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. There comes a point where we doubt God's promises, and in doing so, we suggest to ourselves that God is no longer trustworthy. And David writes, how long should I take counsel in my soul? Uh, the Hebrew term there, take counsel, means to plan. David had begun to plan a way out of things himself. After all, he may have rationalized, and we do the same thing. God gave us a mind. He expects us, us to use it. God helps those who help themselves, right? Ask yourself this morning, is that really a true statement? You may be surprised to know that that statement never appears anywhere in the Scriptures. Stop and remind ourselves of a couple of things the Bible does say. First of all, the Bible tells us that we are to trust in the Lord with all our heart, and lean not to our own understanding. We are to acknowledge Him in all of our ways, and then He will make our paths straight. We are told to commit our works to the Lord, and our plans will then be established. We are told that when a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, the Lord makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. We're told the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision comes from the Lord. What happens when you and I try and work things out by ourselves? Exactly what happened to David. Look at what he writes again right here in verse 2. I have sorrow in my heart all the day. Sorrow, frustration, worry, those end up becoming his constant companions. These are the byproducts of do-it-yourself activities. When will we ever learn to leave our burdens with the Lord and let Him work out the details? There is a fourth response that we tend to fall back on, and that is the one that basically says, I resent this trial. It is humiliating to endure being stepped on. Pride is now wounded. And so it retaliates. How long are my enemies going to exalt over me? Well, it's typical, isn't it? Typical for you and I to complain in that manner. Uh, those type of complaints come from pride, saying in effect that we have the right to defend the truth about ourselves, especially when it comes to some enemy taking advantage of us. We have an innate, natural drive to maintain our pride. How we long to be appreciated, how we long to be well thought of, and David is having to learn that the truth is going to defend itself and it will emerge as the champion in God's own time. And listen, one thing we need to know about God is this. He is never in a hurry. Now, the second stanza of David's song finds us in verses 3 and 4 where we see David on his knees. Follow along in the text. Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. We see David on his face, overwhelmed with grief and hopelessness. And there are a couple of practical areas of application. First of all, it was the length of the test that began to wear on David. Did you get that? How long occurs four times 
in those couple of brief verses. We do well to remember that God not only designs the depth of our trials, but he also designs their length, just as we saw last week when we looked in Habakkuk, and he too was questioning and asking, how long? Secondly, in the first couple of verses, David turns against everyone and everything except himself. We do the same. When we try to handle a test in our own strength in the flesh, we do that same thing. We, we turn against God, we turn against our enemies, we turn against our circumstances, rather than asking for the Lord to show us what He's trying to teach us through that situation. There may be wonderful things that God wants to teach us if our proud hearts will only be willing to melt in the furnace of, aff of affliction. And amidst his grief and his sorrow, David makes a critical choice. Rather than continue this downward spiral of sorrow, he changes his posture now, and he's writing in verse 3, and now he says, Consider and answer me. Oh, my Lord. Something happens between those two stanzas of his hymn. Perhaps he listened to his own complaints, and he realized, David, this is nothing but self-pity. Have you ever found yourself doing that? <laughs> you know, I'm tired of wallowing. Here in verses 3 and 4, we see a complete difference in David. Now he is up off his face and his despondency is being, uh, beginning to lift a little. And at last we find him on his knees, which is the place of victory. Jim Elliot, one of the uh, famed missionaries who were martyred many years ago by the Alka Indians, once wrote, and he said, The saint who advances on his knees never retreats. Notice how closely verses 3 and 4 connect with verses 1 and 2. David seems to uh, recollect and uh, redirect his complaints as uh, he talks to the Lord about them. And, and we see three things that become very apparent changes here. First of all, instead of viewing the Lord as being so far removed and unconcerned like he did in verse 1, now David is requesting that God consider and answer him in verse 3. And don't miss what he calls the Lord here. He calls him my God. Do you see that? The distance due to circumstances is now gone in David's mind, and he embraces a completely different outlook. Secondly, instead of despondency and distress, he now is asking the Lord to enlighten his eyes. And that's a very interesting word, enlighten. Literally, it means to cause to shine. David's countenance had lost its shine. His face and especially his eyes had become uh, hard and flat and dull, and he longed for God's brightness to, to reflect itself once again from his eyes. His face had fallen. When trials are dealt with in the flesh, you know what? Our eyes bear the marks of that fact, and, and we can't hide it. Our entire message becomes rigid and it becomes inflexible and it lacks the sparkle, it lacks the light that we used to have. When inner joy leaves, so does the shine from our eyes. You can see that. Ran into someone just this week who finally, after a number of years, had a tremendous burden lifted and their countenance was so epically changed. Well, the third thing is that instead of worrying about his exalted enemy in verse 2, David now is at the point where he just mentally releases that enemy to the Lord and lets God take care of the results. What a wonderful freedom. There is the change seen in David when he decides to lay it all out before the Lord in prayer. And although it sounds like a cliche, fervent prayer is still the most effective oil to reduce the friction from the daily grind of despondency. And that brings us to the third stanza this morning where we see David on his feet again. Verses 5 and 6. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. 
That first word there in verse 5, but, it's a contrast, as if David is saying, in contrast to all of my earlier complaints and all of my fears and my dullness and my proud heart, now I have trusted and my heart is going to rejoice and I am going to sing again. And notice his exclamations of praise. It is a delightful difference that we can see. It sounds more like the David that we know and love, doesn't it? Don't overlook the last part of verse 6. <laughs> because he, God, has dealt bountifully with me. That is so significant. Why? Because for as much as we know, David's circumstances haven't changed. Saul still hunts him. The barren slopes of Judea are still barren. His hunger continues to gnaw at his stomach. His outward circumstances haven't changed one iota. But his conclusions about those things have taken a 180 degree turn. Why? Because David has changed. Why? Because God has dealt bountifully with him. So what does that mean for us? What encouragement do you and I draw from this song of King David? How can you and I, just like David, rise above our own sorrowful circumstances? Well, first of all, we have to recognize the fact that God uses trials to transform us not our surroundings. Get that. I'll say it again. God uses trials to transform us, not our surroundings. God wishes to train and mold us, and He uses oftentimes the distressing circumstances brought on by evil to benefit us rather than to destroy us. And those evils intended by the world often become the tools that God uses, and in doing so, He deals bountifully with us, deep within where nobody else can see or touch. Listen, you and I have not learned the most basic and essential lessons that God has designed for us in any given trial until, like David, we can also say, He has dealt bountifully with me. Psalm 119, verses 71 and 75, David declares the same conclusion. He says such trials are good for us. He said, it is good for me that I was afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. I know, O Lord, that your judgments are righteous, and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. Paul said the same thing about talking about his thorn in the flesh in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9, when he said, he said, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Much gladly, therefore, will I rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. You see, weakness is not a symptom of a terminal disease. It is simply tangible proof that you and I are human beings. And often it is the very platform where God does some of His most magnificent work. And if the daily grind of despondency has begun to wrap its clammy fingers around you and drag you under, let me encourage you this morning to get better acquainted with this unique song of new hope. Because it will not only be a comfort to your soul, Hopefully it will be able to lift you off your face and put you back on your feet ultimately. This kind of prayer as written by David requires incredible trust in God and in His character. It demands more faith and believing that God can or will change our circumstances if He so chooses. We have to ask ourselves ultimately, are we willing to exercise that type of trust? Let's pray together. Precious Father in heaven, we pray that you would bring relief when we are swamped with the ever-rising tide of discouragement. Would you grant deliverance for those of us who are caught in that swamp and start to slide into those slimy waters? 
Father, encourage our hearts as we face those depressing, dark moments that leave us feeling helpless and believing the lie that things will never change. Lord, will you give us hope beyond the heartbreaks that we experience? Help us, Father, to cling to the inspired words of Peter that if we humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God, he will exalt us at the right time. You will lift us up. Father, discouragement are things that keep us humble. We confess that because we are never discouraged and big-headed at the same time. And so in humbleness this morning, Father, we call upon you as your children and we ask you to lift our spirits by transforming our minds through the Word of God. Will you, will you strengthen us, Father, to see the value of dwelling on things that are true and things that are honest and just and pure and lovely and of a good report? Father, will you help us to fix our eyes and our minds on heavenly things rather than on the things of this earth that do nothing but drag us down? Father, will you give to us a rallying point around your grace? We need that point of focus, dear Lord. Our times being as they are and our moods so given to change. We thank you, Father, that Jesus loves us and that he keeps loving us. Thank you that while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. Thank you that the grace that saves us keeps us saved, regardless of our doubts and those other strange feelings that come and go. Father, this morning we also pray for those weary souls who have never met you through your Son as Savior. We cannot help but wondering, dear Lord, how they ever make it through the day but we ask that the burden of their discouragement would be lifted by the realization that Jesus' death on the cross paid the complete price for their sins. Help them, Lord, to be able to see past their pain to the reality that there is nothing that they need to do or promise or change or give or become in order to be accepted by you help them lord to trust in your son may they do that today and now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to exalt you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy to the only wise god be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and forevermore. Amen. You are loved. We'll see you this next week. So
Church, we lift our voice and pray.